recognize some of these games and over time we'll add more games to this. Uh, right now I am logged in so we can actually click on my account and we can see my profile. We can see the games that I've posted. We can see the games that I've favorited and we can see my recent comments that I've left on these games. So that's part of building a community site. In addition to that, we can actually click on the game. We can click on the image. We can click on the comments and we can actually see the comments themselves and upvote on these uh, comments. So as you're leaving comments on the games, other people can see what comment is the most favorited as well as kind of see other games right from here. And then we have the ability to add the favorites right from the main uh, screen right here. So you can just star this as you go and that'll show up in your profile. So we're gonna work towards building this uh, from scratch. We're gonna take a look at how to build on Bubble. And then we're gonna actually build out the signup functionality for today. So we're gonna be focusing on the header of our application. Uh, so that's what I wanna get started with. Cool so far? Sounds good to me. Cool. So this is Bubble, if you've never seen it before. Uh, and we are gonna start off with a blank page because I feel like it's a very intimidating to turn a blank page into something like this, but uh, I think it's also very like rewarding to turn a blank page into something else. So that's how we're gonna start. This is our index page. And now the very basics of Bubble, if you're coming from Webflow, the little bit of uh, the differences here are that you can actually drag elements onto the screen and you can manipulate them and put them anywhere you'd like. So we can kind of drag out the width. This is different from like traditional ways of doing design, uh, but that's how it works in Bubble. And it actually becomes more and more intuitive because you get this like granular control over each element. So every element that you see here, we have a text element, a button, an icon, just the standard things that you would see, things that you can change. Uh, over time, as you add these things to your application, you'll eventually make it look like this. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to focus on. I don't want to necessarily focus on the design of the application. I want to focus on the functionality of, of how to build something because you can infinitely tweak this and perfect this uh, over and over again as you go. So that's the very basics, right? We've put some elements onto the page. Bubble gives us these, all of these things pre-built so we can just kind of drag them as we go. And once you add an element to the page, you now have created what's called an element tree. So you can see this over here on the left-hand side. And now this elements tree might be something you're familiar with. I'm assuming a lot of MakerPad people are coming from Webflow, but even if you've just used another design tool like Figma or anything else, you might be familiar with how this works. But essentially, uh, you can kind of keep track of what is on the page itself. And you can also keep track of the position of the element on the page. So for example, this button right now is technically at a higher Y position than the text element. So if I drag this up, you can see that the text will be higher. If I put this below, it'll be lower. So it's really important that you kind of just understand that part because we're gonna be grouping things together and using this a little bit more as we go. So let me delete these. And let's actually start building this application by talking about the structure behind this. So right now we are only focused on uh, the design itself. And actually I'm gonna show you something else about the design in a second here, uh, the design tab I mean. But as we go, we're gonna switch between the workflow tab and the data tab. So the three things that we need to make this community application, I'm gonna drag a text box in and customize this text. And I'm gonna talk about this in just one second. The three things we need, we need a user, copy and paste this text. We need a game and we need a comment. And these are going to make up the data types for our application that by doing this, by planning this out, we are gonna be able to customize our bubble app to do exactly what we want it to do. So you might notice that every time I add a new element to the page here, it actually gives me a property editor. And that's existing for every single thing in our uh, bubble app. Everything has a unique property editor to it. So I can double click on this, edit the element, edit, edit the uh, text right here. I can single click on this and edit the text for this text box, so on and so forth. And it's gonna be different for every single um, item that you add, element that you add to the page. So let's actually continue building out this data model so I can show you how this all ties together. So what I wanna do is I wanna copy and paste the user and we're gonna come up with the things that I've put into this application right here. So the first thing we need for our user is we need a username 
and we can say that that's going to be text. Now, this is purely visual, so you and I can all see the data model that we're building, and then we're going to actually go into Bubble and build it. The next thing we might need is a profile picture, which would be an image, right? That's how profile pictures are. They're not text. The third thing we would need would be the way to actually add favorites for that user. So if you had a, a list of favorite games and I have a list of favorite games, they're going to be different. So we're gonna need the ability to favorite this by making this a list of games, just like so. Now, to kind of like keep this in check and what I wanted to tie together before was we can shift click on all of these and we can drop the arrange tab down and group these elements in a group. So now you can notice over here that we actually have the, all of these text box in a group. So kind of doing dual purpose here, showing you the data structure and how to design a little bit more. You're gonna be putting everything into groups as you build on Bubble. Uh, but now you can see that we have group A and we can drop this down and we can see all of our text boxes right there. So we're gonna continue on with the next model that we need here, which is our game model. And we're gonna say our game needs a name, type text, just like we have in our example. We need that. We need all of this information. Game is gonna have a price, price equals number. And a game is gonna have a like box art, I guess you could call it, to actually represent the game itself. And a release date. So we can kind of talk about when the game was released. If we wanted to know uh, when something new was coming along, we can post that and actually have a discussion around that. So again, I'm just gonna hold down shift, click this, go into a range and group them in a group the same exact way. So now I have another group. And then finally, we need to just talk about the comment model itself. And I promise all this will start to uh, click in a minute, but we can add another text element on here. You don't have to necessarily copy and paste it. Uh, and so we wanna hold the comment itself in what I'm just gonna call content. That's gonna be the comment itself. Like all the, the words for your comment go right there. We want to be able to track the upvoting. And there's a funny little story about upvoting uh, that I want to mention. I'll mention that in one second as I, or actually I'll just mention that right now. So upvoting in bubble is actually as simple as setting upvotes to a number. So you might notice that everything that I've done so far is I've explained what type of field these uh, attributes are, right? So username is text, profile, pictures, and image. The favorite is a list of games and upvote and price are numbers. And one thing that's actually really funny that I wanted to mention, so I have this up here is uh, I think like a year ago or so, there was this really neat tutorial on MakerPad about how to build an upvote system with Webflow and Zapier that I thought was ingenious because you basically make this like Webflow uh, call from Zapier to then perform a math operator and add uh, just one just to return it back to Webflow. Uh, and it was just like this really cool workaround that I thought was so worth learning. And then I kind of thought to myself that there has to be a better way to do it. So I'm really excited to show you how simple this is to do on bubble and all in one so you don't have to use the two tools. Um, okay, so let's just move these groups around. And you'll notice here that I didn't group this the same way. And that's because you can also group elements just from the UI builder here, just the same way we're adding elements to the page. You can uh, scroll down here and find the groups in a container. So I can click on this and I can drag out a group the same exact way. Uh, if it gives you two groups, that's okay. We can just delete one. And this group right here, this is like kind of the interesting behavior. Again, you're going to want to group everything in bubble as you see as I design this. Um, but what happens here, and this is a big like pitfall that I think a lot of beginners fall into, is you might think that I could just throw this group on top of it. But notice in the elements tree that the group just went on top in the Y position and none of those text elements actually got grouped. And that's because the way groups work is they need you to actually shift click and put them in the group. Like you can see how it actually changes. Once they're in the group, then you can now control it the same way. And you'll have a little more control over this versus the way that we did it before, because that's going to be a little bit more like flush up against the text boxes. Um, but that's like the basics of designing in bubble. You really just drag the elements in and then you can customize them as you need to. And now, kind of dual purpose here, we have our data model for our community application. And the reason we're starting with data is because once we have the data set, there's very little modification that we need to do. And if there is any modification, you can just go right in and, and change it. So we're going to take the next step here and actually set this data up one at a time. So let's go into the data tab. 
Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is, it's okay. It's just like, it's something that you need that first exposure to, and then you kind of get used to it. One second. <clears throat> Sorry, a lot of talking. But as you'll see here, the user data type comes with every single bubble application out of the box. So we actually don't have to make the user at all. And that's really helpful because it's just going to give us this jump start uh, to actually doing user authentication. It's all right there. But we do need to add in the data types for the game and the comment. So we're going to do that now. I'm just type in game and hit create and hit comment and hit create. So now we have those data types. And now what this really means is that each of these data types get their own database. So we can add entries for each of these things. And we're gonna get all into that as we go, uh, but that's what that is trying to say. So now before we do that though, we actually need to add in the attributes that we've already defined over here. So we can go in to our user and we can add in the username, which is type text. We can add in their profile picture, which is type image. And then we can add in our list of favorites. So I think I called this favorite. And then the field type for this would actually be game. Now, just to like kind of make this make more sense, I'm gonna delete the game real quick, create a new field, type in game again, and you'll notice that the game no longer exists. That's because we're actually relating it to the game data type. So we need to go back and make that. And now- So just to yep. interject just a bit there. So you're saying that when you're creating like a, a new field on the data types of the user, the game or the comment, you, once you press that create a new field, Bubble actually gives you a big list of default options or types. So yes, no, name, number, et cetera. And then yeah. once you're adding a new data type to the left-hand side, it kind of adds it onto the bottom of that list. Exactly, exactly. And that lets us relate it to it. So uh, it'll make a little bit more sense as we do the comment in a, sec in a second, but um, mm -hmm. for the user, you'll see here as I actually fully do this. So we're going to, uh, actually, this is for the favorites, right? So this is our favorite. It's a game. And now we actually have this option here to make it a list. So we're going to say yes. And now on the user type, we have a favorite field for the list of games that that user has favorited. So again, something that you need exposure to, but the more you start doing this, you'll, you'll start to pick it up pretty quickly. So the next thing we wanna do is we wanna fill out the uh, attributes for the game itself, the way we have it here. So we've got name equals text, same thing. You now we need the name of the game. We need the price of the game, which would equal number. And yes, like you were saying, Tom, there is a bunch of other different uh, attributes that you can add. Um, that you can just kind of do as we go. Box art equals image. And then for example, here's a new one, release date equals type date. Okay, now we just have the comment model left to do. And then our data for our community application is set up and that took maybe five minutes. So for our comment, we actually need to do our content, our upvotes, and then I left one out for the game itself. So let's go do that create the field for the comment. So we'll call this content, make it type text. While Jeremy's creating this last one as well, if you've got any questions just around uh, this data model, uh, fields, types, et cetera, um, just pop them in the chat and we can get those answered for you. So this is the last one here. We need the comments to relate to the game that we're commenting on. Otherwise the comments would just not be for anything and we would just have comments everywhere. So it's kind of like you can just extrapolate this and say, okay, if we have a new discussion post in the MakerPad community, that new post has its own comments attached to it. And the way we're going to structure this in Bubble is you can make as many comments as you want and just relate it to the game that that comment belongs to. So just like that, our data structure for our application is all set up and ready to go. Um, and I will leave this here for a little while so you can kind of still visualize it. But we actually want to now start to build this application. How do we turn a blank page into this? Like, what is the next step forward? So we're going to One do a couple of things. I've got Jeremy, sorry, before you push on is why would we, um, why would we do it this way around as opposed to building the page out first? I know it's like a common thing that if we're building something new, because we're used to building things like websites, we oh, kind no. of want to get things put on the screen first and then we, we do 
the data second. So in Bubble, when you're building applications like this, we kind of flip that on its head. Do you want to kind of explain why yeah. we do it this way or why you personally would do it this way? So the, there's two answers. I mean, the honest answer is that we've seen a lot of people over time not make data types. <laughs> they wouldn't make a game data type. They wouldn't make a comment data type. They'd put it all on the user. And as we get into doing the sign up flow next, you'll see why you should not be putting the rest of the logic for the application inside the user. So we're kind of doing it from that point of view of we want to show you how to build out the data types, but it's also actually the, what I think is the right way forward because you can be designing your application to the end of time. And part of the thing that uh, is particular about Webflow in as like, as I'm taking it, because I do have that experience there is I remember just perfecting my design 24 seven. And that took away from actually building the functionality of the application. I'm not saying that it's bad and you can absolutely start with a mock-up or wireframe, whatever it is that helps you visualize it. I just think that by starting with the data, you don't really need to edit it the way you need to edit your design over time. You know, over time, your design is going to change. I did this design in a matter of a couple hours over a couple days. And if I spent more like a week, a year, whatever it is on this, this would look completely different. Um, so, gotcha. you know, that's like the, the visual impact that I think that has. Whereas like behind the mm -hmm. scenes, once this is set, it's set. You don't need to change it as much. Got Hopefully it. that answers nice. the question. But yeah, I guess, absolutely. you know, all the same, you are free to do it however you would like. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you know, you'll find those principles that work for you best as you start building on Bubble. So gotcha. actually part to that, everything has a property editor like I showed before. So if I double click on the text, I get all this property editor for this specific text element. If I single click then on this group, I get the property editor for that group. Likewise, the page itself also has a property editor. And this is like maybe kind of hidden at first, but once you get the hang of it, you can see that the page has its own settings as well. You can change the page title here. You can see some of the other uh, settings that are with it. Uh, in particular, what I'd like to do here is change the width of the page to be for desktop. Uh, so we're going to make this 1440. And my personal preference, I don't like having the height of the page be like 3000. So I'm just going to make it something smaller uh, just so we can see it. And now before we actually move forward, uh, I want to preview our application so you can actually see these elements on our live website. So Bubble is, you know, both visual programming and designing and everything else, but it's also the hosting platform for your app. So right away, I'm able to preview my application right here. You can see all of our text elements right here. And the cool thing about this is if I move something, our version here will then notify me that the page is updated. So I need to refresh the page. And when I do, that change will be reflected. So this is really convenient for doing your testing. And that's the important part here. When you click on preview, you're actually in the development preview of your application. So out of the box again, Bubble's gonna give you two different versions for your application. You have the development version, which is what you're using, and then you have the live version, which is what your users should be using. So the actual posts for our game community should be on the live version of our application, and on the development version of our application, it should be just our fake data. Um, in our actual board game app over here, you can see that I'm also in the development version, version test. You can see that at the end of the URL. And in version test, this is where I have all of my fake data. When I actually deploy this application live, version test won't be there and none of my data will exist. So our users have to add it. This is different than a lot of tools out there um, in the no-code space, particular because it's like a common theme that everyone has to fix and build uh, in public and it's not, it's not a regular thing to have two environments. So yeah, yeah this is something I mean, which can, is quite unique. You can think of it like a, like a staging site, I guess, kind of comes out uh, first. Um, but it's really nice because you can hand out the, you can hand out this link and you can send it to other people working on your application. You can test it with other people. Um, there's a lot of things you can do and you can also just deploy it to live right away and work on the live version. Uh, on other plans of bubble, you can have multiple different versions. So if you wanted to have different branches of your application, if you were just experimenting with something, you can do that. Um, but for this, just using development and live is important because you're going to want to separate the data. You're always going to want to test out your, your actual like programming first. You don't want to just deploy something live without having the test. As we get into the database, I'll try to show more of the differences between development and live. 
But now that we have this, we want to, again, start to turn it into this. Now, this is where we're going to start. We're going to start with the header of our application. Most of you probably know what this is, but just in case you don't, I'm going to explain it again. Our header of our application is kind of like our main site navigation. So wherever we go on our application, the header stays there. And it usually just has like your brand, the ability to log in and log out, and your profile itself. So you've seen this everywhere. You know that this uh, stays with you. And what's really cool about Bubble is Bubble gives you it out of the box as well, gives you uh, what's called a reusable element. And I can drag this out and I have the default bubble header. So one thing I can do here, and I haven't shown this yet, is I can actually center this to the page by dropping the arrange tab down with something selected and hit center horizontally. And that'll center it to the width that we are currently using. So right now you can see that these are not exactly centered. And this actually is a different width than the desktop width I set it to. But I will preview the page in a second and you can see the header now change. So there you go. So now you have this header out of the box, right? So now it, it can start to look like an application. And it's great that Bubble does this because when you're actually building your application, you can just customize this. But I want to show you how to build this from scratch. So we're going to look at how to build this and actually make it expand the width of the page just like this. And then we're also going to build out this sign up uh, login workflow that you see here. So let's start doing this. The one thing you're going to notice right away is that when I drag this onto the page, it, it's not exactly the same as the text element, right? Like when I hover over the text element, nothing happens. But when I hover over this, you can see that it's just showing me the name of this reusable element. And that's actually because it is a reusable element. What that means is this header itself exists somewhere else. So we can only edit it wherever it exists. And that way we can actually put this onto multiple pages and not edit it on every single page. So we're not repeating ourselves. This is like a really good like way to get in, like it's a good habit to get into to make reusable elements. Uh, and the header is where you start with this. So how do we actually do that? There's two ways. You can drop down the pages drop down, and you'll notice that we actually have some other pages that come with uh, when you make a new application. For example, the reset password page comes with our boilerplate. And look, you can see there's our header. Same thing, header A. Uh, and we have a 404 page as well that you can that is automatically set up to point uh, people to. And you can even see on the preview here that our header is there as well. And then actually, if you drop down even further, you can see where we actually would edit that reusable element which is right over here under header. So what we wanna do is we wanna make our own. So we're just going to hit add new reusable element and to not conflict with our names, I'll just call this header new and hit create. And I will set this up the same way we set up our page. So I can double click on this, get its property editor and I can set up the width for desktop. And I can set the height roughly between 70, 75, 80 pixels, depending on your preference. This is, this is why going into design is just subjective. You can just make it whatever you'd like. Um, so then the next thing I actually want to do is go in and change the color of this instead of it being uh, white. I think I have this color memorized. I do. So I will use this blue color to represent our header. And now you'll notice that we actually don't have an element tree at all. We, we are completely without it. And that's because this is basically being treated as if it's its own page. Uh, and when you double click on this, you'll notice that it has even more special properties that let it be a different type of container, a group, a pop-up, or a floating group. That doesn't necessarily matter so much right this minute. What does matter is we want the element tree to show up. So we're gonna click on the group and drag this in. And you can kind of see it. I, I think the blue was maybe a bad choice there, but you can kind of see as I drag the group in that now we have an elements tree. So now we're telling, or now it's telling us that we actually have an element on the page. And I'm going to double click on this. And now this is like as much as my design shops get uh, technical, I'm going to make what's called a container for our um, header. And I'm going to make this 1140 since our um, actual width is 1440, 1140 is like the standard for design and I'll make the height match or get close to that. And then using that handy trick from before, with it selected, I'll hit arrange, center horizontally, and then I'll center it vertically. So now we have this group in the middle of our header. And just to start making it a little more visual, I'll take a text element 
And this is something else that I really like about Bubbles uh, editor in general is that when you don't just have to drag and drop it, you can really draw this on and it gives you more control. And the more you use Bubble, the more fun that is. So in the same vein of um, reusableness, let me just call this board game universe. We actually have styles. It is its own tab and it's definitely worth going into how that works, but I'll kind of save it for a little bit. But by default, you have these predefined styles. You can think of this as like global styles if you're using like uh, CSS or if you're coming from that. Uh, that's kind of what it gives you. You can obviously edit the style. It'll bring you right into that style in the styles tab and then you can customize the font. You can change the font height and, and everything else about that. But again, we're gonna focus on the actual functionality versus the uh, look here. So same thing with this text box. I'm actually going to push this up against the group and then I'm going to center this vertically. Uh, and then we're gonna go back to our index page. We're gonna delete this, scroll down, find header new in the reusable elements section, which you could also make a new one right there, and drop this in, and then line this up with the width of our page, and we'll update our application. So cool, now it actually shows. Now we're, we're kind of starting to build this blank page into something more. Cool so far, everything's Good. I need some more water. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was good to see how you kind of laid out the the groups and everything. Because I think that's one simple um, like design aspect of Bob, which is quite tricky to grasp once you haven't used it before. So yeah, if there's any questions around around that, let us know. But yeah, I think that's kind of one of the little um, nuances that's kind of important to know. Yeah, um, it's it's you're going to be grouping everything as you as you build. So. Now we actually have our own header. And now we kind of want to wrap this up. We want to connect the design and the data that we set up together. And this is how this all comes together with uh, workflows. So another way to edit a reusable element is you can double click on it and get its property editor. But this is the reusable property editor. So it doesn't look like this. Uh, it looks like this. And we can just hit edit element. And what we want to do next is put in a button like so. And we're just going to call it sign up. So, I mean, one of the things that I kind of really liked about coming to Bubble in the first place was the fact that they handle users out of the box. You know, even using WordPress, uh, it, it is finicky, right? Like it takes time to like really get your, your plugins correct and whatnot. So I was kind of amazed that this, this is like with it, like as soon as you make a new application. Um, so let me show you how this actually works because it's pretty mind blowing that this is all done for us. So what we want to do, if you recall from before, it was in a pop-up. So we're going to take the actual pop-up container and drop it right into the middle of our group. And we're going to actually get a pop-up. So you can customize this all you want. And you'll notice that if you actually click out of this, the pop-up will go away. But the pop-up is inside our group and it's actually hidden uh, by default. So you actually have to toggle on the visibility to find it again. Uh, and that's on purpose because you don't want the pop-up to be showing every time you load, you want to actually probably like, quick question. Why would you put the pop-up inside your group instead of the nav? Um, you, you can put it in the actual reusable element. There's actually no real difference other than organization. Um, I could put this up onto the, um, group itself, but it's actually just, up to you. And I, I guess it could come in um, handy for specific things when, like later down the line, if you wanted to send data to the pop-up, um, mm -hmm. technically you could send data anyway, but it might be good to just keep it organized that way. But so you just like right. to put it there because this is something you're dealing with in terms of like the sign-up button itself. So you like to group everything that's to do with that button inside of that group. Yeah. And without getting it, without getting too complex with this, if you're actually going to be building, you even maybe want the sign up button and the, the pop up itself to be in a reusable element. So then you have this like reusable element inception. Um, and it, it just nice. kind of, it kind of just carries on that way. Um, gotcha. But since we don't want that for this particular purpose, I just put it in the group, but I don't think there would be any functional difference if we did put it in the actual reusable element other than pure okay. organization. Cool. But Okay, so let's design this pop-up. So the first thing we can do is we can open up the property editor and rename it. Now our renaming is actually up here, which is hidden for a couple people sometimes, but we can call this pop-up sign up just like that. And 
what we want to do is we just want to design our signup form. Now I'm going to just do this relatively quickly. Sign up for board game universe and I'll give it a nice style. Something like that. And then I'm actually going to uh, select a new element called the input element and drag this out. So now what we need to do is we actually need to match the attributes that we made before in our data model. We need to match this for our user. So we actually have three. We have our username, um, we need our email and our password. Technically we have a profile picture that we wanna add, but we're gonna do that in the next uh, workshop next time. Cause I'm gonna show that with uh, when you actually upload the game box art, I wanna show that then. Uh, so right now we're just gonna stick with input elements. There are a couple other input uh, elements that you have. So you basically have total form control, which is really cool because you could do uh, multi-line inputs, which will come in handy for our actual comments. You can do check boxes, drop downs. There's a whole bunch of things that you're not like limited to the regular like HTML um, form element. You can really customize this however you want. So you're, you'll notice that when I uh, put this out here and I actually just need a button to sign the user up. So we'll just do this. You'll notice that we actually need to fill out these input fields because otherwise they all just say type here. So I'll double click on the first one and I'll change it to username and we'll make sure that the content that it expects is text. And I'll click on the second one and we'll do the next one and we'll set this one to email and we'll change the content format to email. That way this input box is expecting an at symbol and like a dot com. And then finally we'll do the last one for password and we'll set this one to password so it'll actually hide what the user's typing. So then what we want to do is just click all of these elements, hold down shift, arrange, and group them in a group. And then we can put everything together, center this horizontally and center it vertically. So it's nice and sitting vertically. You can actually hover over and see um, how far away it is from the edge of the pop-up uh, just with your, your mouse hover. We can also just you know, customize this however we'd like and make this larger, but that's again, design, it's up to you. Okay, so now we actually have the attributes for our signing up for our users, but we actually need to sign them up to our application. And this is where it all comes together. We can double click on the button and start what's called a workflow. And when I click this, it's gonna take us directly into the workflow tab for that reusable element. Every like single page, every reusable element gets its own workflow, uh, gets its own workflow tab essentially. So when we click on sign up, it's going to take us right here. And now what this we is have a saying, quick question, Jeremy, sorry to um, stop you before we get into, just before we get into workflows um, from Colin, he says, uh, can you make a second version of a reusable element? You mean like duplicate it? Uh, yeah, I guess so. So maybe that duplicate it with kind of some different tweaks to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can clone it actually. When you make a new reusable element, you can just clone it right here. So if we wanted to call this like header two and uh, take header new, we could just kind of duplicate it that way. If you're thinking of like editing, like it as like a symbol that doesn't really exist, but this is your closest thing to that. Gotcha. Um, nice. And then you can just delete cool. things right here. So if we wanted to get rid of that, we can. Simple. Okay. So yeah, so this is like, and this is why we start with data first, right? Like we're, we're getting into data then design and now we're gonna actually go into the workflow itself. So again, I'll bring the pop-up up. up and we will double click on this to start the workflow for this button. And now this is, this is like, to be honest, the power behind Bubble. It's its workflow uh, tab. So when we click this button, we have all of these actions that are available to us that are essentially programming. This is where you're doing all of your logic, but it's in the most like readable way possible. It is, is in everyday language. And you know, you can sign the user up, you can navigate to other pages, you can create entries in the database, you can send emails. There's so many different things that you can do, but obviously for this, we just want to sign the user up and that's it. Like literally you just need this one action and then the user will sign up to your uh, application. Obviously we have uh, something interesting here, which is we actually have some issues. We have the email and password field that are missing. We need to now tell this action where to find those values. Something really neat that Bubble does too is it automatically catches your issues for you. So we actually have this issue checker right here 
that's going to show you or remind you to fill something out if you forgot or if you filled something out incorrectly, it'll have it right here to show you uh, and actually take you right to that issue. So this is good because you actually want to make sure your application has no issues whatsoever because you will not be able to deploy your application with, with any issues. That's something that Bubble is doing to prevent you from actually screwing something up, I guess. So, okay, we want to sign the user up and we need to relate this to this input, the input username, or sorry, the input email and password. So the way we do this is we click where it says to click and this brings up the expression composer. Now this is a whole topic in and of itself, but essentially the expression composer is going to know what we need to get from that page. Since this is a workflow for the header new reusable element, it is going to find all the elements on that page that it could possibly need and we can get that element. So in this case, we need the input email and then it's gonna continue building the expression out. Again, this is our equivalent of programming we need that input email's value. So whatever the user types in to this field, we need to capture that and that's how we do that. We get the value of that input. Same thing for password. We click, we go all the way to the bottom and we get the password's value. There's other things you can do with the password. As you can see, you can require a password confirmation. So you could actually give them another input field to like retype their password. You can send the email to confirm it. You could actually send them to another page. Oops. You could send them to another page, like, thank you for signing up. Please go confirm your email in your inbox. Uh, and then you can have like a remember the email checkbox. So all of those are there for you um, out of the box, but you're gonna notice that this is, this is it for what comes out of the box with the signing the user up action. But we actually need to add in the username, right? Like that's what we put over here. We have the username. Um, and again, we'll go back and do the profile picture after, but this is where you do that. You hit change another field and then we click and you can see that we now have access to the username profile picture and the favorite as well. So the username, we're just going to point to the input username's value. And there we go. Now we actually finish this. So when we click this, our user will actually sign up to our application. We're gonna do that in a second, but there's more to add to this workflow. But if you have any questions, Tom, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to emphasize like one point, if anybody's kind of starting to build projects, uh, no code style, this is probably one of the big differentiators from say building a site in something like Webflow and then building an application in something like Bubble. With Bubble, you kind of, all of this user authentication and sign up and favoriting is exactly what Bubble is built to do. If you're doing it in something like Webflow, which is meant to be like a, a website designer, which has a CMS attached, user authentication can only be done by connecting multiple tools together and sending data in between applications using Zapier. And it's kind of something which you have to make work rather than bubbles designed exactly for this use case. So that's kind of a key differentiator. And one to think about if you're actually trying to think through like what your application needs to do and what functionality it needs also. Yeah. And it's, it's cool because then you don't have to pay for multiple services, but you also just don't have to learn multiple services. If you're coming from no tech background, it's, mm -hmm. it's like daunting to learn multiple services. Absolutely. But I understand too, because I was kind of baffled when I first saw this. I was like, really? They, they just have this out of the box? It just works? Um, so I'm excited to show this in a second. But we cool. want to actually uh, continue with this workflow. So when you're building a workflow, you have unlimited amount of actions that you can do in succession. So I can click to add another action and Bubble's actually recommending to me that I might want to send like a, a welcome email or a confirmation email. That would be a logical next step that I could do. And then I can get the user who just signed up and send them the email for that exact email input value that we captured. Um, that's one way you could take this. I'm actually not going to do that. And instead, what I want to do is I want to reset the input fields and I do this and Bubble does this as well. Uh, in this particular workflow, they recommended the send email action on purpose, but you want to always make sure that you're clearing these input fields. So that way, if you, you did ever open this pop-up again, they wouldn't actually be pre-filled. The password itself would go away, but the username might stick around if you don't do this. And most of the time, it will recommend to reset relevant inputs when you're doing a, a form like this. And then the final thing we want to do is we want to clean up the pop-up. We want to actually hide the pop-up. So when you click sign up, the pop-up goes away. So we can hide this by just finding the pop-up itself and just hitting hide. 
So now the workflow is going to sign us up, reset the inputs, and then hide the pop-up for us. So let me actually just finish doing this because now that we have the sign up set up, we actually need to show the pop-up because it's invisible by default. So we're going to go to this button, double click on it, start a workflow, and then type in show, just like we did for hide, and then show the pop-up. So now we can just even go back to our live preview, refresh the page, and there's our sign up button. And when I click this, we can actually see our pop-up work. So now our workflow is working for that. I can sign up with the username Jeremy and then sign up. It's going to run the workflow to sign the user up and it's going to then add us to our database. So this is why it's connecting all the dots together. So now we go into the user itself or sorry, we click on app data and then we go into users and then you're going to see me added into the database. So this is how this all comes together. Now this is our app data. In other words, our database, which is similar to like a Google Sheet or Microsoft Excel file. You get these rows of information. So as we add games and comments, these, this table will be filled out. Now for the user, it's pretty cool. We actually have the ability to authenticate as any user in our application. This comes in handy later on as you like are debugging your application or if one particular user uh, kind of contacted you with an error, you can always check to see their account. So this is kind of a superpower and just one, like one other like layer on top of having users authenticated for you. Uh, you get this authenticate as, which would have been like a pain to code. So, okay, let's go back and let's take a look at this. So right now, technically we're signed in, but we have no indication of that. So what I want to do is I want to put a text element right here just to give us that like notion and tell us who is signed in. So again, I'm going to go into the styles and just use some of these predefined styles. I'll take this one. And now I could just write, you know, Jeremy, like hard code it in, but that's going to show up for every single person who uses this application. We don't want to do that. That would be everybody's name, Jeremy. We want to actually dynamically get the user who just signed in. And this is the coolest part of bubble. You can insert dynamic data, and same thing as we saw before, here's an expression composer. And this is how we can compile uh, expressions. And the one thing that we want to do is we want to get the current user. The current user is this concept. So like regardless of if you're using users or not, you have this uh, like access accessible for you where you can get the current user and find out if they're logged in or not. And this is really helpful for exactly what we're doing. Uh, and also conditional statements when, it, when you're required to actually uh, like check to see if the user's logged in. So all we want to do here is we want to show the user's username or email, but you'll notice that if I hover over this, it's evaluating to a user and not text and we're in a text box. So this is just like starting to like peel back into some of the more complexities with bubble that like take some time to learn. But what we want to do is we want to find one of these things that is equivalent to text. So we could get the username and then our issue goes away or we can get the email if we wanted to. Uh, I'll do the username since we set that up purposefully. And now when I update the page, we can see that Jeremy is the user that's logged in. Kind of cool. Um, but another thing that we want to do is we actually want to show that we have the ability to log out, right? So now that we're signed in, we actually want to make sure we can get out of this application. And quite simply, it's as simple as copying and pasting the button. Now, when you copy and paste something that has a workflow, it will not copy that workflow with it from the design tab. You have to copy and paste the workflow manually. Um, so I copied the sign up button. I'm going to call it log out. And now technically I'm going to set up this workflow. Uh, I guess I'll do that at first. So let me double click on the log out button, start the workflow, go to account, and then just hit log the user out. It was that simple. And what that does is it's going to find any current user who's logged in and just log them out of the application itself. So now what we want to do is we want to make sure that the logout only shows for people who are logged in. And one thing that we didn't mention before is in the property editor for all these elements, you have a conditional tab to do conditional logic, like if then statements. In bubble, it's when this happens, do this. So what we want to define here is we want to say when the current user uh, is logged in, this element is visible because we only want to show uh, the logout button when we're logged in. The only problem with this is every element by default has this element is visible on page load 
checked for you. So you want to make sure to turn that off. So just like how our pop-up is invisible, in a couple minutes when this refreshes, and probably not even a couple minutes, a couple seconds when this refreshes, this will be like that. This will be hidden. So same thing for our sign up button. We only want to show this conditionally when the user is not logged in. So when current user isn't logged in, this element is visible. However, we can leave this uh, because we also want this to be visible on page load. So now when I update the page, I can actually see the logout button and I can hit logout. Um, without overwhelming and going too much further, there's only a couple things left to do here for today. Um, I want to show something else that Bubble uh, allows for us to do that's really, really cool, which is step-by-step -step mode. So you'll notice that we're running version test, which again, this is our development version. And then we actually have debug mode equals true at the end of this. And what that's saying is we actually get the Bubble debugger at the bottom of our page. So if I change this to step-by-step -step and I click on log out, Bubble is going to actually run each action that we set up one at a time until I run it next, until I go through it. And what this lets us do is it lets us just kind of look at what is running so we can really debug our application. That's what it's there for. So right now it's identified that button logout is clicked. I hit run next, and now it's gonna to move to the log the user out action. I hit run next, and you can notice that behind the scenes here, our text element's gone because we're not signed in, so there's no current user, and sign up is now the only thing that we see. So kind of really sweet that this comes with it as well because this lets you really uh, debug all of the things on the page if you ever get stuck. Um, but before we finish this up, I just want to set up our page and our other pages that we need. We only need the other pages for our profile and for our game. So to do this, I'm going to actually get rid of our visual cues here now because we don't need these anymore. We have these in our data model. And I'm going to set this up to just have our call to action and our container just so we're ready to go. So I'm going to do this by dragging a group out and I'm going to set this to 1440. Now this is getting into designing in bubble. And this is something that, I, again, this is why I think going back to your earlier question, Tom, it's just something that you can just spend so much time tweaking that you're gonna wanna just spend time on it outside of doing the functionality. So the thing we'll do here is we could set up a style for this. Um, I, I might as well do that just to show you. I'll create a new style. I'll call this primary background or give it a naming convention that works for you. I'll edit it and then I will give it the same color that I did before, which was 127 FBF, but then I'll just make it a little darker so we can kind of see things on this a little clearer. And we'll come back and it'll have this style. So now we have a group that expands the entire uh, page width and we're starting to make it look more and more like our example application, give or take. So then what we wanna do is we wanna set up the same type of container that we've done uh, in our header so we're gonna drag a group inside of this group and we're gonna make this 1140. And the height here doesn't really matter, it's kind of up to you. Uh, but I'm just gonna set this up live so we have this. We're gonna put a text element in and the more you use it, the more you use bubble, the faster you're gonna get at this. So uh, actually we don't need dynamic data here. This could be like, uh, what did I say over here? I wrote discuss the latest board games to hit the market. So. So there we go, we have a nice little headline like this. And you can kind of see how this page comes together now, hopefully uh, more than you have. So this itself is actually too large. So I might like go into the text and just like crank the font size down. But now anything that's using the style will now automatically get um, this styling. I'll also make this centered. Uh, and then we can just add in one more text element. Uh, I think that added in over here. And we can just say join the community of board gamers and discuss the latest games. I don't know. This can be your little like slogan. Uh, we can make this light. And now what we can do is we can actually center this on the page. So I'll select this container and I will center this horizontally, center this vertically. Um, same thing with the text elements. I can center this horizontally and center this one horizontally as well. This is where it gets into it, right? You can just start customizing and customizing. If this is too small, we can make this larger. 
Um, the last thing I want to set up here, though, is I want to put in a page container to handle the rest of our community application next time. And I want to make the other pages by cloning this page. So the last thing to do here is to drag another group on. Let's, uh, we actually probably could make it a style, but let's just leave it as the default group. One really popular um, styling group for the default is to just leave it blank. So that way your group can just be invisible. Um, but we'll make this 1140 and we'll just kind of push this up on the page like so. And then our page is set up and like ready to actually make our community site next time. So what I want to do is I want to drop down the pages drop down, add a new page, call it profile page, and we'll clone it from the page we just set up. So then next time we'll come in and we'll edit this page with already pre-existing structure. And we will add another page for the game page. So when you actually click on the game, it'll clone from the index page as well. So that is where I think we should be stopping for today. <laughs> it's a lot of information. There's so much more uh, to cover. So next time we can actually get into setting up the ability to see all the games that the community has, seeing uh, our users sign up and actually, or now that our users can sign up, we can see their profile, we can add stuff to their profile, like their game favorites, have uh, the actual post for those games. Uh, so there's a lot more to come with this. And then obviously my favorite, the upvoting uh, for the comments itself. So uh, thank you guys Amazing. for joining. That was and, great. It's good to see how you kind of think about um, like structuring your application. Cause I know this is one of the things um, that sometimes causes a problem when people, I know I do it, just put things on the page and then try and figure out like how, how a user kind of flows through the site and then what to build first. And you just end, end up getting a bit of a mess. So it's good to see you using like the data first and then coming through and then putting a little bit on the page, like picking one piece of functionality, like the login, sorting out first, building the workflows and then moving on to the header, et cetera. So it's good to just see how you thought, thought through it. Cool. If anybody's got any last minute questions for Jeremy, you can uh, get, add them into the chat. I think we've got a couple of minutes to answer them. Um, and also we've got obviously another session coming up on Wednesday at the same time, a couple of days from now to again, work through this app and build out some more functionality. So if you're not already registered for that, then just pop the link in the chat, get yourself registered for that. Um, and yeah, we'll be cruising through on Wednesday as well. Is there anything else that you want to say, Jeremy, about anyone like starting out apart from joining this webinar again on Wednesday, where should people go if they want to kind of play around with Bulb between, between now and then and what resources should they look at? Yeah, absolutely. So we just released a couple crash courses that kind of go over this, um, not as in greater detail, but they should start to reaffirm everything that you just learned today. Um, so you okay. should head over to the Academy, which is bubble.io slash Academy. I can pull it up on my screen in a second. Um, yep. But that's going to be your next stop is to watch those crash courses, go through that. And then we have some really cool interactive lessons that'll show you how to build certain things out in the editor, uh, which is another great like resource available to you. Okay. But the thing to think about, uh, I think, or the biggest takeaway here is that like, yes, you want to have the um, image in your, your head as to like what your application looks like, but you want to then think about what that data looks like too. Because I'm telling you, the mm -hmm. second you have that data figured out, you know, you will have to make changes every now and then and, and go back and modify it. But when you have that data figured out, you can just focus on the design and actually just focus on running the application. So that's, that's the biggest takeaway. I know it's, like you said, it's, it's backwards <laughs> from everything else that we've been taught, but I do think that it will set you up for success later on. Yeah, it's really helpful. Um, Colin had a question. He says, um, rather than have users create the data in your tables, can something like Airtable be used to import and update the tables. For example, if you're building a directory website where you wanted to control what gets added. Yeah, so you absolutely can do that actually. Um, we, uh, we just updated the Airtable plugin. So one thing I didn't mention or get into is that Bubble actually has a whole plugin ecosystem of all of the bubbler, bubblers uh, building plugins uh, that will let you do things like that. And I believe we are the ones who made the Airtable plugin, so we maintain it. So you can just install the Airtable plugin to your app and you should be able to connect it straight to your Airtable uh, database and use that if you don't want to use the bubble uh, data tab. 
Um, so that way you can kind of preserve any data and get some of those things. I've only used Airtable a handful of times, but there is documentation for that right away. So you can just install that plugin and, and start using that. Amazing. Jeremy, thank you very much for taking the time. And Jess, also thanks for answering the questions in chat. And thanks everybody for joining. Hopefully that was really insightful and you learned a few things. I know I definitely did. And if you want to go away and play with some functionality in Bubble, start building out your apps. And then if you want to sign up for the second workshop on Wednesday, bring back any questions that you might have re-functionality and then we'll get them answered probably straight off the bat before you dive in on Wednesday, get those answered and then dive into building up the rest of this application. Exactly. You can kind of see right here, if my screen's still loaded, you can see that we're going to be uh, diving into building out um, the groups that we need to actually get our games loaded, the user profile itself and I don't know, fun functionality stuff that's coming next. So yeah. Amazing. Same. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day wherever you are. Jeremy, Jess, thanks again. And hopefully see you all on Wednesday. Yep. See you then. Catch you later. Bye.